guys go. And I know that you're going to have a great time with Miss Debbie. I think they're also working on some fun, uh, some fun stuff that uh, maybe they're going to present next week on Christmas Eve. So that'll be fun. We're looking forward to uh, we're looking forward to that as well. And while we're dismissing our kids, I'm going to have you guys go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter seven this morning. Matthew chapter seven. We're going to be in verses one through six. So Matthew chapter seven, verses one through six. We're continuing through the Sermon on the Mount this morning, uh, and we're we're rapidly heading towards a conclusion. Although we won't be able to do that today because we're only going to touch the first six verses together. Uh, and while you're doing that, I just wanted to share a couple of things with you that I thought were really, really great. Uh, and one of those in particular was that uh, Stephanie was sharing with me that there were 24 ladies who went to the party yesterday at Lauren and Isaiah's house. So that's pretty amazing, guys. I really thought that was pretty special. And I know that there were several of you that weren't there, so I got to thinking about it. I'm like, we could have easily had like 40 ladies probably there at that party. <laughs> So, uh, so ladies, next time, don't miss it. I think they had a really great time. Uh, and, uh, and if you did miss it, you were missed. Uh, and, uh, and I know that, uh, that that's pretty exciting. But also, that got me thinking, guys, uh, I thought we were kind of uh, moving forward with getting the numbers together. So now the ladies are starting to match and maybe exceed a couple of our events. So we might have to come together as guys here very soon uh, so that we can have something for just the men as well. Uh, but in the good news in all of that is it's exciting to see the body of Christ meeting and gathering together. Yesterday was an opportunity for what I think is really special and really important. Multi-generational ministry happening. Young girls to mature women and everything in between. Ministering to one another. Special times. Very special times. So... Uh, do not miss the opportunity to do that. The next opportunity we'll have to do something kind of together, I guess, as a church, aside from our Christmas Eve service, uh, is that on New Year's we're going to be having an opportunity to come together. It's our family service because it's the fifth Sunday. And so we're going to do our family service. But instead of doing our potluck right after church like we normally do, we're actually going to do it that night. And so from 6 to 9, we're going to have events happening right here at the church. And Isaiah and I are trying to craft... Some things that actually force uh, generations to mingle together a little bit in a couple of, of activities or games. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. And so, uh, and then at 9 o'clock, though, the youth will take over and you heard what's happening. So by 9, you may decide it's time to go home and celebrate New Year's or go to bed. Either way. Uh, <laughs> but at uh, 9 o'clock, the youth will take over the building. So you have been forewarned. Uh, it will be a lot of fun, but uh, not for the faint of heart. Okay? So I'm sure Isaiah wouldn't mind, though, if you want to stay around and hang out and have some fun with the youth. So, all right. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. And, uh, I'm going to take a moment to pray. Uh, because it's important this morning that we really understand this text. This is important. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is so rich and so full of things that we need to understand. He's speaking directly to us as disciples, but he's also speaking to the religious and to the Pharisees. And I don't want to miss that. I don't know about you, but I want to understand what Jesus is saying in this text that's often been misused and misinterpreted. And, and, and it's really important that we understand it. So I'm going to pray for us to have understanding this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, will you give us understanding this morning as we read this text together? This is your word. You're about to speak directly to us. And what a privilege and a joy that is. And not only are you speaking through your servants, you're speaking as God. This is Jesus. These are the red letters speaking to us this morning. And we want to understand. So Father, as you pray for your disciples, I, I ask that you would do the same for us. Give us eyes to see this morning, help us to see what you're saying. Give us ears to hear. Help us to understand what you're saying. Lord, and give us hearts to receive it. I think you have something for all of us this morning. Those who believe, even for those who do not believe. Yes. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us all through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I preface this this morning because this text is perhaps one of the most often misused or misunderstood yeah. texts. And so we're going we're gonna to look at it together this morning. And we want to, at the end of this, have an understanding of what Jesus is saying to us. 
That's important. If we want to be his disciples, then we want to know what he's saying. That has a lot of implications for how we live in this world, doesn't it? Yes. And so we want to understand this. So we're going to read it together, starting in verse 1. Uh, so Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you in pieces. All right. Mm -hmm. So, some, uh, some interesting things there that are not going to be unfamiliar to many of you, uh, but something that is often misinterpreted and misunderstood. So, right away, I want you to notice something, though, because this particular verse begins with this idea of do not judge, that you be not judged. However, right away, we see something that could be a logical contradiction that's going to help us to discern, actually, what Jesus is and isn't saying here. And on one hand, he says, don't judge. But on the other hand, he's actually encouraging us to judge, to be discerning, to be mindful. So which is it? Don't judge or judge? And the answer is both. God is telling us something here, and we want to understand it so that we can rightly apply this. On the one hand, he's saying don't judge. And on the other hand, he's telling us, use that judgment to be discerning. This isn't a contradiction. It actually helps us understand what Jesus is and isn't saying in this important text that governs our interaction with others. In fact, this morning, what we're going to see is we're going to see what not to do. That's what Jesus is saying here. So this is talking about relationships with other people. And he's telling us in this first six verses what not to do. And in the next several verses, which we'll get to after Christmas, he's going to tell us what we should do do. And between these two things, he's giving us a comprehensive understanding, as simple as it may seem, a comprehensive understanding of how we should engage with people. How we should engage in relationships with the world and with one another. It's amazing how Jesus does that, isn't it? How he takes something that's seemingly so complicated, because we can understand, relationships can be complicated, can't they? We can have lots of difficulties in our relationships with others, and yet Jesus boils it down to a few simple things that if we will follow them, will help govern how we interact with one another and how we interact with the world. Jesus is masterful in that. And so that makes this pretty important, doesn't it? Jesus is giving us instruction on what we shouldn't do and what we should do as we interact with people. And today we're primarily focusing on what Jesus tells us we shouldn't do. This is an often used and oft misunderstood text by Christians and non-Christians alike. In fact, undoubtedly, you've probably heard this quoted and misquoted by many people, including those that don't necessarily follow Christ or know God's Word. You've probably all heard somebody say, don't judge me, or who are you to judge, right? We've all heard that. It's quite fascinating how many people of the world have heard and held on to this verse, even if they know very little to nothing else of what the Bible says. And that's actually part of the problem. They don't understand what the rest of the Bible says. They hear something that does what? It speaks to their flesh. But it's also true with many well-meaning or misguided people who have interpreted it or misinterpreted and used this verse wrongly to suggest that we are not to condemn sin or evil. That we are only to, quote-unquote, love people. That's often another misunderstanding or misinterpretation of this verse. And the problem with that understanding of love is that it isn't actually loving. It's the opposite of that. It's hateful. It's hateful to affirm sin and to allow the death and decay it brings in another's life. As opposed to pointing them to truth, to freedom. So it's important we understand 
that definition of love, how the world uses love, and how God uses the word love. Clearly, it's important that we take the time and the energy to understand what Jesus is and isn't saying, as opposed to leaning on our own understanding or opinions. Because typically, when this verse is mistreated, that's exactly what we're doing. We're either trying to justify something as the world often does, but even Christians do that, don't they? Who are you to judge me? You do these things in your life. We have to use that as an excuse to continue to allow our flesh to do what it wants to do. But we also lean on our own understanding when we try to love a world in a way that isn't correct or isn't biblical. Where we would affirm sin, and, and even we've seen how that has actually infiltrated and had an effect, unfortunately, on even the church itself. There are things that are now tolerated uh, in churches that should have never been tolerated. Why? Because the Bible speaks clearly about them, that they are indeed sin. So God needs us as his disciples, as followers of Jesus, to understand what he's saying so that we can love well. And we're going to see that this morning because it is important that we love well. Now, people may not always receive it as love, but Jesus is giving us the template for how we are to behave and interact, how we are to love well a world that is also under the bondage of sin. And the Word of God is so useful for helping us in this regard, isn't it? The Word of God is useful. It's a filter that we must use. We don't want our own ideas or understanding because we're likely to get it wrong. But Scripture always interprets Scripture. So we can go to the Word of God to understand the Word of God. And we must be very cautious not to take things out of context or, or look at just a single context without considering and understanding the whole. That is foolish. To, to not take into account all the other things is foolish. To read it in isolation without context and understanding leads to all kinds of problems and issues. How many of you have actually said something and somebody took a portion of what you said out of context and used it against you or misinterpreted and read into what you were saying when that wasn't actually what you meant? How many of you have had that happen? I'm sure many of you have. If I were to ask you, to, I'm sure hands would go up almost everywhere. Every one of us has probably experienced that where somebody took something that we said and interpreted it into something we weren't actually saying. And so it's even more imperative, is it not, that we don't do that with God's Word. Mm -hmm. That we don't speak things that God isn't saying, and that we don't leave out things that God is saying. Yeah. Come That's on. really important. The world does this all the time. But so do those sometimes who are knowledgeable about God's Word. But He has called us to be disciples and ambassadors of His kingdom. That's what He is us to be. So we must be diligent to do the work to understand His Word. That's what we're doing this morning. That's why we pray. Lord, give us eyes to see. Yes. Give us ears to hear so that we can understand Your Word. So I'm going to go over, before we kind of get into an outline, a few things about what this text uh, doesn't mean and a few things about what it does. And then we're going to get into the practical. What it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we aren't to make judgments, that we're not to discern. It's clear in the Scripture, because Scripture interprets Scripture, that that's not what Jesus is saying. In fact, in this very section of Scripture, He tells us to be careful about doing something. He tells us not to, uh, not to cast our pearls before swine, for example. Not to give what is holy to the dogs. Well, how do we know what that means if we don't use some amount of judgment or Come discernment? On. Come on. How are we going to know? And so it's clear that that's not what Jesus is saying, that we shouldn't throw discernment out the window. In fact, 1 John tells us very clearly, in 1 John 4, 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So how are we going to test and know that something is true if we don't have discernment? If we don't use right judgment? In fact, Jesus himself tells us to use right judgment. In John 7, 19-24, Jesus is interacting with some Jews and with some Pharisees. He says, has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Wasn't that true of what we've studied so far about the Pharisees? Mm -hmm. They weren't keeping the law. They were creating their own that they thought they could keep. But they weren't actually keeping God's law. Right. They certainly weren't keeping the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. 
So he tells them this. He says, if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, because Jesus has just healed somebody, says, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Jesus says, are you angry because on the Sabbath I actually healed somebody? Yeah. You guys have become judges of the law instead of doers of the law, mm -hmm. is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to tell them, do not judge by appearances. Judge with right judgment. Yeah. It's clear. We are to use good judgment and discernment. So clearly, when this is saying, Amen. don't judge lest you be judged, it's not saying, don't use discernment. We should be using discernment because Jesus has told us to use discernment. The word, interpreting the word. The other thing that this isn't saying is that we're to be tolerant and indifferent towards sin. And especially within the church. Now the Corinthian church was going through a lot of problems. So that was very, very obvious. And there was some deep sexual immorality that was happening in that church. Paul said it was so shameful that even sometimes the pagans wouldn't speak about that without, in a sense, like blushing or recognizing that there's something wrong with the action that was happening. But the Corinthians were almost kind of patting themselves on the back, saying, look how tolerant we are. Doesn't that sound like some areas of Christianity oh, yeah. these days? Come on. Patting themselves on the back, saying, look how tolerant we are. We are so open. And Paul says, wait a minute. God has called things sin. And so Paul tells him, he says, though I'm absent in body, in 1 Corinthians 5, by the way, if you guys are wanting to look this up later, starting in verse 3, says, for though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And as at present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such things. <clears throat> so Paul is saying, it's okay to judge when something is inherently sinful, obviously sinful, and especially within the church. Within believers, because later Paul says, I didn't tell you not to associate with the sexually immoral, meaning of this world, because if you did that, you wouldn't be able to associate with anybody. <laughs> They're all sexually immoral, is what he's saying. And boy, doesn't that speak to our culture right now? Yeah. You can't go anywhere without sexual immorality everywhere. So if you're going to withdraw completely, you're not going to have any contact with people of this world. He says, No, I'm talking about people in the church. I'm talking about people who call me God and call me holy. If you call me holy, you are also to be holy. Do not tolerate sin among you. Now that doesn't mean that we're uncompassionate with one another. But Paul's being very clear here. This is a sin that's open. Everybody in the church knows what's going on. And yet he says, and you do nothing about it, you tolerate it. He says, no, I've already pronounced judgment. It's wrong. It ought not be going on. And so we have this picture in the scripture that we are to judge sin. In fact, he says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? In other words, if we are tolerant with little sin, and this wasn't a little one, by the way, guess what it does? It affects the whole. Yeah. Isn't that what leaven does? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so when we become accommodating to sin, regardless of how big or how small, it has an effect on everybody. So we have to be careful. <clears throat> so obviously, clearly, we are to judge sin. And especially sin within the church. Something that is obviously against the scripture, that is unbiblical, we have every right to say, that is not right. It is sin. This also doesn't mean that we engage the world and one another with a tolerance towards Evil and sin that masquerades as this false love. As I mentioned before, it's actually hateful, not loving, to let people die in their sin, or to let the destructive nature of sin bring death and decay and pain into people's lives because we think it is loving to remain silent about what the Bible clearly speaks on. When the Bible speaks clearly, we must also speak clearly. Amen. And let me just... Like, this is for us to hear this morning as a church. We need to be ready and willing at all times to not just be the ones to speak to the sin that we see in other people's lives, and to do so with gentleness. In fact, we're admonished by Paul that we are to do these things in gentleness. Isn't it the kindness of God that leads us to Amen. Repentance? Yes, it is. And we should approach yes. one another with kindness mm -hmm. and in the way that we would want to be approached if it were us. Yeah. But let's also hear that, that we would be approachable 
that we would be the kind of people that, I don't know about you, if there's something that's wrong in my life, and I'm being a poor witness and a poor testimony to the world around me, I want you to tell me. I want to know that that's the case, especially if I'm in sin. If I'm in some sin and I am blind to see it for some reason, and you see me say, whoa, pastor, this just isn't right. Amen. That's hurting our witness. Yeah. Then it would be important for me to hear that, wouldn't it? Yeah. It'd be important for all of us to hear that. I was watching a documentary this week about John Chow, uh, and I don't know how many of you guys know about him. He became a martyr to North Sentinel Island. He, he wanted to go and share the gospel with the North Sentinelese people, the people who had never heard the gospel as far as we know. And this documentary was not pro-gospel, let me just tell you that. It was definitely not, but I loved what I saw from him, because I don't expect the world to understand that. Yeah. I don't expect the world to understand what the Bible says, to think the way that we think, to understand what it means to love, the way that God says to love. But I loved that John Chow, his friends were talking about it, said, you know, we were all struggling with things in our life. We were all, you know, in a sense, kind of hypocrites. We formed these accountability groups, and, and all of us were struggling with various areas of our life. And I think specifically they mentioned the area of pornography. That was an area that they were all struggling. He said, but not John. He lived above reproach. He lived with a single focus, and he wanted to please God. And in one of his Facebook feeds, one of his social media messages, he says, if you, and this is when he's a young person, not somebody who's mature in Christ in the sense of being mature in age, a young person, but definitely mature in Christ. He said, if you see anything in my life, I want you to point it out, if it's not pointing to Christ. That's good. I thought, man, That's good. what great maturity for a young man who would ultimately go and give his life, trying to reach people that have never heard the gospel. Powerful. But we need to be people that want to hear. The Bible tells us, Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You guys ever experienced that? There are a lot of people that will, oh, they'll feed into whatever it is. They come alongside. But a friend doesn't do that, do they? They don't just look at your life and say, oh, that's okay. They say, hey, wait a minute. Hey, that's not right. A good friend, a faithful friend. Yeah. Those wounds are the kind of wounds that we and the kind of wounds we're talking about here are a harsh lashing and a whipping. It's the understanding that, that our sin is being confirmed. That's what the wound that we're talking about here. A friend that doesn't allow us to continue in a pattern of self-harm and self-destruction because of the pattern of sin in our life. That's a faithful friend. Yeah. Jesus literally came and died and was raised again. He suffered and was wounded so that we could be healed and so that all could have access to salvation. Sin's a big deal. It's deadly, and only Jesus brings life and reconciles us to a holy God. Remember how we sang today about how holy God is? Only Jesus gives the, us even the ability to approach that holy God. Praise God. Praise Jesus for that. Amen. Amen. Our brothers and sisters, they need us to be faithful friends to one another. We are blinded by sin or wandering into its destructive nature. Yeah. And yet, how we do that matters, isn't it? Yes. How we do that, and that's a part of what we're going to see, what Jesus is addressing here in a moment. But I also want to talk about what this does mean. We are not to be overly critical or to operate in a critical spirit. That's really, really important. That's a huge part of what Jesus is saying here when he says, do not judge lest you be judged. How you judge matters. Don't be critical. Don't be like the Pharisee. We're not supposed to be hypocritical. We're not supposed to be like the Pharisee who was self-righteous. We hold to a biblical standard as opposed to our own standards and preferences, unlike the Pharisee. We are not wanting to be self-righteous. We do not take the place of God either. That's not what this means. We don't have the right to take God's place. Who is the ultimate judge? Who is the one who condemns or who sets free? God. At the, end of the, at, the end of, uh, at the end of time, as we stand before the throne, and there is a, a group of people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who will enter into his rest, we still will face a Bema Seat judgment. And all the works and all the things that we did and how we did them will still uh, be seen by God. We want to be people who are faithful to not be critical, but to judge rightly. But then there will be a whole bunch of other people who stand before a holy God who will say, yes, enter my heaven, or you are condemned. And if their name isn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will be judged by the deeds and their actions. Yes. But it's God's job to do that. 
not ours. The world is already living in condemnation. It's already condemned. It's already living in its sin. It doesn't need us to come and continue to proclaim that. It needs us to come and proclaim life. It's not wrong to say this is sin, but we must point them to Jesus. Yes. And what goes along with that is that we're not given to judging motives either. And that's really critical when we're talking about judging within the church, right? When we're talking about our brothers and our sisters, we need to be very careful that we are not judging motives. Only God sees the heart. Man looks at outward appearance. God looks at the heart. So we need to be careful about judging motives. We also have to be careful that we're not given to personal vengeance and justice. That is not ours to take. That is not ours to take. So what obviously goes along, what does this mean? It also means we engage people with compassion. We engage a world that's lost in compassion. We engage our brothers and sisters with compassion. Yes. We're not looking to be the sin police. We're looking to be compassionate people who love and look out for one another. That's what God has called us to do. And that's how we should approach this. So let's go through a short outline this morning. I'm going to just give you three, uh, actually four points. If, you, if you're writing these down, this is going to be helpful as we step through these verses together this morning. The first one is this. Do not be critical. Do not be critical. Do not have a spirit and a critical heart that looks like the Pharisees. That's one of the first things that we see here. Verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That's a great warning to be careful how you judge others. Yep. Now, judge that you may not be judged. I think many have thought this to mean that how we treat others is how we will also be treated by them. A sense of reciprocity. And if you don't want to be judged by others harshly, don't judge harshly. There is certainly some truth in that principle, is there not? But the way that we treat others is probably going to be the way that they tend to treat us back, isn't it? Yes. So there is some truth in that idea and in that principle of reciprocity. However... This really is speaking to God and treating you with the measure of how you treat others. Mm -hmm. And that brings a different set of concerns with it, does it not? Yeah. That we would understand that the way that we treat others, God has said that's how it will be measured back to you. A holy God says how you treat others is how it will be measured back to you. And as I mentioned before, we will all face as believers in Jesus, thank goodness for his blood. Amen? Amen. Thank goodness that our names can be written yes. in the book of blood. That this, for believers, will not Amen. be a question of, do you get to enter into my rest or not? However, even for believers, there is still a beam of seat judgment. How you treated others will still matter. And it will impact how God judges you. Did you judge other people's motives wrongly? Did you judge your brother or your sister in things that weren't yours to judge? Were you overly critical towards those in your life, your brothers and your sisters? Or even for that matter, overly critical to a lost world that needed to see Jesus, Amen. not yeah. condemnation. That's right. Those things will be something that we answer for as believers. Not about whether we get into heaven or not. But there will be important things, rewards even, that are, that are given, which we will all still cast down and say, worthy is the Lamb. <coughs> it is important how we treat others in this life. It will, as my, one of my favorite quotes from the movie Gladiator, what you do in this life echoes in eternity. That's exactly what's being said here. What you do in this life will echo in eternity. If you judged harshly, here, you will be judged harshly as well, even if we are saved, and yet many of our works are just burned up before us because they weren't done in love. They weren't done, or, or there just weren't any good works, much that we have to show. And then for non-believers, there's the great white throne judgment. Everything you demanded of others will be demanded of you and more. If you're not a believer this morning, and you are not under the blood of the Lamb, 
you will face a judge who says you will be judged for everything that you've done. And even more so for the things that you did to others. Those things will be measured back Come on, to you. That's good. That's good. That does not leave this morning any room for self-righteousness in any of us, let alone anybody who thinks, I can go to heaven because I'm basically a good person. The only way that we will be in heaven is by the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Amen. Believing in him, receiving that free gift of salvation that he has given to us. That is the only way that we will stand rightly before the judge of the universe who judges righteously. Thank you, Lord. So understand that the way that you treat others in this life will have a profound impact on the judgment to come. Yes. It's a fearful thing to think that not only would we not be able to enter heaven on our own merits, right? Mm -hmm. But that then we would also be judged and punished for the way that we treated other people. Thank goodness for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. You know, the parallel accounting in Luke's gospel presents us with a very, uh, with another very helpful component. It says, judge not and you will not be judged, condemn not and you will not be condemned. Isn't that interesting? He actually uses the language, condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. There's a principle there. Be liberal with the good things. Right? When we forgive others, the Bible actually tells us we must forgive others. Yeah. But when we forgive others, that reciprocity of, for, uh, of God towards us is we are forgiven of everything and much more than we probably had to forgive them for. Yeah. And that's not to downplay the significance of some of the hurts that we have, been, uh, that we have faced from people in our lives. I'm not saying forgiveness is easy. I'm just saying we must do it because God has forgiven us of every sin and every treason and everything that we have ever done now, past, present, and in the days to come. What right do we have to withhold forgiveness? What right do we have? And understand this, and this is really, really important because God is still a God of justice. Listen this morning. If you're having a hard time forgiving somebody who's deeply hurt you, and yet we've been commanded to forgive, understand this. God is still the God of justice and vengeance. The same things Amen. that are being said here that will apply to us will apply to people on that day. Those who have done unspeakable things and have not sought God, have not sought repentance, that will be visited upon them as well. Yes. Your, your heart and your sin uh, both will, will, be, uh, will be handled. In that day. Yep. Yep. And so will That's the right. sin of others. Right. And those that hurt you will have to be, be under the blood of the Lamb as well. And isn't that what we ultimately want anyway? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that ultimately what we want? <clears throat> is people who have done wrong things because they don't have the love of God in their heart. Yeah. <laughs> to come to know a loving God and for Him to completely change and transform their lives. Isn't that what we want at the end of the day? So I know that sometimes it's hard to forgive, but we are not given an option. We're also not called to condemn the world. It's already under condemnation. When we are overly critical, we bring a condemning and judgmental spirit. So also, when we appear self-righteous or when we act self-righteous, how did Jesus approach ministry with outsiders? Have you ever noticed that? Are you critical towards others? God will apply the same standard towards you. Do you think God will forgive you if you refuse to forgive others? Earlier in the same sermon that Jesus is presenting in the Sermon on the Mount, he told us in Matthew 6.15, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's such an important thing for us. Forgiveness is not optional. Amen. Being critical is not what we are called to do, but rather to be compassionate. Our heart should break for sin and for those under its power, and we should desire their repentance, not our vengeance. That's 
what it means to die to ourselves, to be followers of Jesus. That's what it means to be his disciples. He is sharing with us this morning how it is that we are to be his disciples, how we are to walk this differently from the world. This is so different than the world, isn't it? We're living in a time that we just, we, I don't want to say affectionately, but we commonly call it uh, a cancel culture. Why do we call it that? Because if you've ever done anything wrong, we're going to find out about it and we're going to destroy your life. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus is speaking to his people yes, here and to his is. disciples. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I'm calling you to love. I'm calling you to forgive. I'm calling you to help bring reconciliation. We shouldn't long to see those people destroyed. We should long to see them come to repentance. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, God will take care of that because he is the righteous judge. Amen. I wanted to share my own story for a minute. Because forgiveness is an optional. Our heart should break for sin. We should desire repentance, not vengeance. And Amen. I just have been, the Lord has been dealing with my own heart in this recently. Because people will mistreat us. We've been mistreated many times. Many, all of you have been mistreated by other people. We've all experienced that. Where we were unfairly, uncharacterized. Uh, you know, things that were said that were not true of us. Things were, were done to us that were evil, that were wrong. And oftentimes... We look at that, and we look at that, and we say, God, why don't you visit this upon my enemies, right? It's very easy for us to want to do that. Even if we don't take it into our own hands, a lot of times our heart is, God, bring them to destruction, bring them low. And I found myself feeling that way at times about <coughs> people. And, I've, and here's what's, what's, what's true. I want God's name to be glorified. And when people do things that that actually smear God's name before the world, I don't like that. Even more so than, I, 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 than what happens to me personally, I don't like seeing God's name blasphemed before the world Amen. because the way believers act towards one another <coughs> or people who claim to be believers will act towards one another. But the Lord's been dealing with my heart and saying, I don't want you to wish ill will upon people. I want you to wish repentance for people. Isn't that what God really wants at the end of the day? Isn't that, if that's what God wants, isn't that what we should want with the people yes. who have done wrong to us? Yes. Even people in Jesus' name, even our, our brothers and sisters especially, mm -hmm. that we would desire repentance, not God's vengeance. Mm -hmm. Now it's okay to say, God, make sure your name is not blasphemed. Do whatever you have to do so that, that, there is, that your name is glorified, not smeared. But we should also equally, if not more, be praying, but bring those people to the repentance. Yes. yes. Bring people to repentance. I don't want to wish more evil on people than I do desire for repentance and love. Amen. And reconciliation. That's good. That's really good. I hope that you guys feel the same way. So that's the first point. Do not be overly critical. Do not be harsh. Do not be harsh with the world who needs to see Jesus. Do not be harsh with one another for our brothers and our sisters. The next part of this, verses 3 through 5, tells us not to be hypocritical in how we judge. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? We're being told something here, and I want you to think for a moment, how many of you have ever had something get into your eye? And I mean, it can be a small piece of dust. It's an irritant, isn't it? And you might find yourself scratching that thing, working back and forth, trying to get that thing out. It's not something trivial, let alone maybe a speck of sawdust. How many of you have ever had a speck of sawdust in your eye? Like That's not trivial, is it? No. No, it's not. So we're talking about something that's already an irritant. And so we're not talking about something trivial. I think it's really easy for us to look at something like this in the scripture and say, oh, it's just saying, don't, you know, take the little speck out of your, out of your brother's eye and ignore the plank in your own. That is what it's saying. But understand that the speck that's in your brother's eye is a big deal. It's an irritant. It's something that causes harm. It causes pain. And so it's not something trivial. And that should make the point even more important then. That we would not make sure that we're doing something to somebody. That we're not treating somebody that way. That we're not looking at somebody else's sin and ignoring the massive elephant in the room that is our own sin. Come on. That's good. That we're not ignoring the very thing that needs to be dealt with in our own life as we attempt to help somebody else along. Romans 2.1 goes on to explain this even further. It says, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. 
from passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you judge and yet practice the very same things. Isn't that interesting? That's a real call right there not to be hypocritical, isn't it? Not to judge others for things that we ourselves are doing. And let me also just give you one more word of warning here. This is a real warning to those who would claim to have knowledge, isn't it? This is a real warning to teachers like myself, mm -hmm. but anybody who would stand up and say, this is what the Lord of the Lord says. You know why? Because that means we know or we claim to know what it says. It is incumbent upon us then to live by what it says. To be a good example to those around us and those who are underneath us, especially in our discipleship. Do not be like the hypocrite. Do not be like the Pharisee. Do not be hypocritical in how, not only how we live, but how we see other people. One of my favorite examples of this comes in the scripture where there is a, a, a story that Jesus tells about a tax collector and a Pharisee that go together to the temple. And one of them stands and looks at the other, and that's the Pharisee, who, by the way, Pharisees hated tax collectors, saw them as the scum of the earth, as vile, as sinful, as treasonous. And he looks at the, at the tax collector and he declares one in his heart, at least I'm not like that guy. Right? He's looking at the other guy. And yet the tax collector, what he's doing, he says he wouldn't even lift his head. He just beat his breast and said, have mercy on me, O Lord, a sinner. Yes. And it says, who was the one of that day? One who the one who looked at the other and said, at least I'm not like that, is not the one who left us alone. <laughs> they both had every reason to say, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. So we need to be careful how we look at others. We need to be careful how we judge others. And of course, Jesus is speaking here to the Pharisees, and we've gone through this if you've been here with any amount of time during this particular series. We know that one of the problems was that the Pharisees created a Pharisaical law that superseded God's law, and it was about them being self-righteous. So that helps give us a little bit more understanding and insight into this text, too. Because if he's saying, be careful about that thing in your brother's eye, then what is that law that might be in your own eye? Yeah. Let me suggest this morning that what the scripture is saying is, be careful of self-righteousness. Be careful that you're not looking at your brother's eye and completely ignoring the very thing that's in your own, or worse, holding them to a standard that even God does not hold them to. Holding them to your standard instead of a biblical standard. We have to be extremely careful. I believe that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. There's no room for self-righteousness. It's okay when we're talking about with our brothers and sisters to say that's wrong biblically, that's sin biblically, and to help one another walk through those things. It's a whole other thing to condemn others for things that the Bible does not condemn them for, to hold them to a standard, Come to look on. down upon them, to stand up in our own self-righteousness yes. and look down on our brother or even look down upon the world because none of us are righteous but through Jesus ultimately. Amen. Amen. It is the blood of Jesus that makes you righteous <coughs> that makes you righteous. That must be the lens by which we see others. Which actually steps right into the next point conveniently. <laughs> And the reason I broke this out into its own point is because it actually spans both of them. It spans not being critical and judgmental towards the world and towards others. It also talks about not being hypocritical. It's do not take God's place. Do not take God's place. That's point three. We are not to judge motive and what we cannot see. It is one thing to judge obvious sin, but we are to be careful to make judgments about the things we cannot see. Paul faced a lot of criticism from that Corinthian church and from outsiders and people in his ministry, and even from people within the church. At one point in Corinth, it seems that Paul was facing some specific criticisms about his ministry, or there was some backbiting within the church. There were some that seemed to be forming factions even within the church, saying, well, I follow Paul, and I follow Apollos, and I follow Peter. And he says, who are any of these people? We're just servants of God. Yeah. We're just one who plants, another waters, it's God who gives the growth. To have these factions isn't right. There's one that we all follow, and it is Jesus. And so Paul tells us, though, something very important principle here that we need to hear as brothers and sisters. 
In 1 Corinthians 4, 3-6 it says, But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. This is Paul speaking. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. In other words, I don't even know if there's something wrong. I don't think there's something wrong. But that in and of itself does not acquit me. Amen. Acquit me. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Mm -hmm. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. In other words, he's saying, live for an audience of one. Live for an audience of one. Be careful what you judge in others. If it's not something that's overtly sinful, that's not strictly biblical, then we need to be very, very careful about judging the motives of another person in their own heart. And listen, I'm speaking from a very personal audience. Yeah. Because I know what it feels like to both do that, to judge others wrongfully, and I know what it's like to have my motives wrongfully judged. Yeah. And I'm sure that you do too. Mm -hmm. That's really, really painful when we do that to others or when that happens to us. And it does a lot of damage. We need to remember that it's God who sees the heart. It's God who will commend or condemn. It is God who judges rightly and righteously. And he's really the only one. He's the only one that can judge the unseen things. <clears throat> Romans 14. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is uh, before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. He goes on in verse uh, 10 and says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or, or you, why do you despise your brother? For he will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Remember that. When you are looking to judge one another, be careful. Remember that there is one who judges justly and rightly. He will judge. <coughs> we cannot, for we do not have the same wisdom. We cannot speak. <coughs> James 4 tells us there is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. It is to him that we entrust ourselves. The one who judges justly. That's what Jesus did. If we're looking at the example, what did Jesus do when he was wrongfully accused, when he was mistreated, when all these things happened? It said he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And he had every right as someone who didn't sin, as God, to take out vengeance right then and there. He didn't, did he? Jesus is the example that we are to follow. We entrust ourselves to him, not to the world, not to any other person. We answer to one alone. God. Amen. So right along with this too, what are things that this implication do not take God's place? Condemnation and judgment isn't ours. It's God's. John 8, 7 through 11, and this is one of my favorites because this is definitely when we're talking about the world. It is not our job to judge this world, to condemn this world. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. Now he's coming back rightfully to judge, isn't he? He's coming back in the second coming, and, and at that point, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and he will judge. But he didn't come that way the first time around. And John 3.17 actually tells us from Jesus' own lips, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Did you hear that? He didn't come to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Most of you are familiar with this, but it, but it fits perfectly. John 8, 7 through 11. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up to them. This is the woman caught in adultery. He says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Talking to these religious <coughs> Pharisees who in self-righteousness were trying to trap Jesus. And he said, what does the law tell us we must do to this woman? He says, I don't know. What does the law say? And he sits down and he begins to write in the sand. He says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And he bent down and wrote more on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go from now on, sin no more. I did not come. Condemned, he came to save. Amen. And guess what? 
as his disciples, he's been commissioned in his place to do the same. Our job is the ministry of reconciliation to people who do not know God. So who should we be paying attention to if we're going to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation? Should it not be our king? Should it not be our savior? Should it not be the one who went before us and said, as the Father sent me, even so I send you. As disciples, we need to hear this this morning. How Amen. we treat the world matters. How we treat one another matters. As I mentioned before, vengeance is not ours. It is God's. Peter is talking about Jesus. And I quoted from this just a minute ago, but I want you to write this down. 1 Peter 2.23. It's such a wonderful verse. It's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the example of who we are to follow. He says, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. Isn't that already right there a difficult one for us? When we're reviled, what's the very first thing in our flesh that we want to do? We want to do it back, don't we? We want to justify ourselves, and especially when wrongfully accused. What's the first thing we want to do? Is stand up and hit back, isn't it? But Peter tells us, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. And remember, Jesus had no sin. Did nothing wrong. Unlike us, we've had plenty of sin. Did nothing wrong. It says, he did not threaten, but committed himself to one who judges righteously. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Listen closely. When we take that in our own hands, we've taken something that belongs to God alone. God said, vengeance is mine, not vengeance is yours. Amen. Go ahead if you're rightly, if you feel rightly and justified. No, it doesn't say that. It says, vengeance is mine. When we operate in vengeance personally, when we try to exact that, when we do that, we take the place of God and we take something that belongs to God alone. It is God's role to bring vengeance and judgment. It is our job to call people to repentance and repentance. So last one, use discernment, and we'll end with this. Verse 6, do not give what is holy to dogs nor cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under your feet and turn them in, and tear you into pieces. Now this may be one of the most challenging things it is to learn because we're talking about discernment here. So clearly Jesus wasn't saying when he says don't judge, he's not saying don't use discernment. But I want you to listen, Jesus didn't speak all things to all people. <clears throat> He didn't just share everything with everyone. He spoke certain things to the crowds. He spoke certain things to the Pharisees and to those who thought that they were righteous, who were self-righteous. And he spoke specific things only to his disciples. That's difficult for us, but it's something that we need to learn as disciples, to, to have that kind of discernment. And he's saying here, don't give what is holy to the dogs. Don't give something that is holy to those who do not care. Do not give pearls, cast pearls before swine. A pearl back in that day would have cost you probably almost all your fortune just to obtain one good pearl. And he's saying, don't take that and cast it to a pig. Can a hog actually appreciate a pearl? No. It's going to eat it, trample it, right? And then when it's going to turn around, it's going to do the same to you. He's giving an example to us. Do not waste your time. Your time matters. How you use your time, what you say, and how you say it, and to whom you say it matters, and it requires discernment. After his resurrection, Jesus only showed and revealed himself to believers. Isn't that interesting? To his disciples, to those who believe. He specifically refrained from going and showing himself to the masses and to Pilate or to others who really failed to follow or believe in him. So even Jesus demonstrates this kind of discernment. So we must be extremely wise, especially in the times in which we are living, because time is short. The Bible tells us to be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. How we spend our time matters. How we share with others matters. We do not have the luxury of wasting time, nor is it wise, with those specifically, and listen, with those who are hardened and hostile. I used to spend a lot of time in atheist forums. I thought that that was a profitable use of my time, arguing with people about faith and Online, Dad? Online, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, Joe, online. Yes. It's fun. We're all family here, right? Interactive this morning. 
Yes, I would argue online with atheists and, and spend a lot of time, and I spent a lot of time speaking to people that were both hardened and who had no heart whatsoever to hear what I had to say. Not only were they hardened, they were extremely hostile. Now, I looked at it as good practice, but in retrospect, looking back, you know what would have been spent a lot better time? It would have been spent a lot better time going and befriending my neighbors Ooh, and spending amen. time with them. Coming over and, and, and inviting them into our home, doing something tangible and in relationship with others. Be very careful how you spend your time doing the things that God has asked you to do because time is precious, isn't it? Mm. We want to have the biggest impact. You know where, where I felt this? I'm just going to be honest with you guys because it's hard when you go over to a place like Uganda and you see the harvest field is so Everywhere we go. Opportunity for ministry. Opportunity to share Jesus. Opportunity to do these things. And then you return to a place where there's just as much opportunity, but so much hardness. And people don't want to hear. And listen, this is a good principle both in, in your evangelism and your witnessing, and also in your disciple making. Because if people don't want to hear, you are wasting your time continuing to argue with them over and over. You share, you continue to plant and water seeds, but it's only the Holy Spirit that is going to give the growth. Do not attempt to continue to engage people that are openly hostile to the gospel. It will not produce the kind of fruit that you're talking about. And it goes exactly against what Jesus is telling us to do here. The same is true of our discipleship and our disciple making. Everybody is at a different place in where they are, but you cannot make unwilling disciples. You can't make unwilling disciples of this world. You can't make unwilling disciples of people who believe but have not yet decided that they want to follow Jesus with every part of their life. And if you attempt to do that, it will only frustrate them. It will only frustrate with you. But here's the, the flip side of that. If people are hungry for God, Amen. if people are hungry for God, give them the best of your the scripture tells us, make good use of the time because the days are evil. I think that's yes. exactly what Jesus is saying to us. Don't waste your time in unprofitable areas. Learn to be discerning about the usage of your time and the things that you say and the things that you share. Jesus did. Shouldn't we do the same? Yes. That's the implications for us as we talk about this in, in light of the Great Commission and in light of the Gospel. It's important that we understand what Jesus has done for us. It's important that we engage the world in the way that Jesus engaged the world. Amen, church? Amen. Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here together, to study your word, to go through your word together. And Father, to look at a passage of scripture <coughs> that has been misused and mistreated and misinterpreted at many points in time, but yet is so essential. But it's so essential that we understand what you were saying here. You're not telling us not to use discernment. You're not telling us not to judge uh, obvious and, 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 and ugly sin. But you are telling us to be careful about how we judge. Not to be overly critical. Not overly critical with the world. Not overly critical with one another. That we should be careful. That we shouldn't be hypocritical. That we shouldn't be self-righteous. That we shouldn't take the place that's rightfully yours. The judgment seat of God. Lord, help us to hear what you're saying this morning. Not that we would withhold truth, but Lord, we would learn to speak truth in love. Lord, that we would learn to share hope with people and share truth with people in a way that is, that is not critical and condemning, but in a way that brings people to repentance and to a belief in God. Father, I pray that you will help us with this. Lord, help us as individuals, help us as a, as a church, help us grow in what it means to love you and to love others. Lord, today we have an opportunity to look at what we're not supposed to do. In a couple of weeks, we'll get an opportunity to look at what we're supposed to do. And through that, Lord, I pray that you will help us to understand how we can better interact in our relationships with the world and with one another. Lord, ultimately, what we're asking you to do is simply this. Conform us into the likeness of your Son. The Spirit of God that has already been placed in us, help us, Lord, to do these things that you already desire of us. Help us to submit to you and to your will and to your word, allow it to do the work that you desire to do in our hearts so that we can be effective in the work that you've called us to do as your church and as your disciples. Lord, we love you this morning. I don't want to take that place that's rightfully yours. 
I don't want to carry bitterness and resentment in my heart, but I don't want to carry unforgiveness. Help us all with this, Lord. Help us to remember that you have forgiven us of everything and that you have called us to forgive and to love <coughs> that is under the bondage of sin. Lord, help us learn how to love each other well, that we would learn to be faithful friends, that those wounds of a friend would indeed be sweet and helpful to us. Lord, that we would learn how to do that well with one another, not in a way that's aggressive and, and painful, but Lord, in a gentle way, the same way that you do with us. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Help us to be kind and gentle as we correct one another in our lives. Thank you, Lord, because I believe this is exactly what you are doing in your people and in your church and in us. So we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to close with a worship song. So go ahead and worship team. Sorry, I didn't give them enough warning to come up. So. Think about that as we sing this morning.